and you're used to going out and foraging and hunting and all of a sudden a pack of lions move in. What? How, how dare you? <laughs> One of the common questions we got was, are there any no-go areas when doing a non-surgical rhinoplasty? And the honest answer is, I don't really think about the face anymore in terms of those black and whites, like an absolute no and an absolute yes. Everything is risky and there are degrees of risk. And the way that I make decisions is around, can I justify that risk for the patient's benefit? Is this injection likely, so likely to create a result that makes them so happy that I can offset the potential risk? And can I also do that injection in a way that takes into account that risk? Because there are very risky areas that you can treat. The nose is the number one example, where if you take into account the risk and inject in a safer way, you can actually do it, I think, safely. But you have to not just say it's risky and I'll do it anyway. You say it's risky and therefore I'm going to do the following 10 additional steps to make it safer. A common theme around the questions we got was that I'm trained, but I'm too scared to do this procedure. And this is all over the place in medical aesthetics that I think it's the people that we actually want to be doing this procedure who are too scared to do it. And here's some of my thoughts on this. I was one of those practitioners who held myself back due to fear of complications and as many of you all know, I produce a lot of content around that topic with the goal of helping people over that. So the analogy I like to use is if you were stuck in uh, 10,000 years ago, cave woman, caveman, and you've got to feed your family and you used to go out foraging and hunting, but now a new lion pack move into your neighborhood of caves, um, then you are going to um, naturally want to retract into your cave and stay there for safety, which is what we do when we refuse to do procedures down to risk. What would happen over time is you would start to think, I can't just hide here. I have to figure out how to get out there and get my food. And what you would do naturally is start to study the environment. You'd figure out when are these lions coming and going, when are at the waterhole, what is their behavior like when they've just been fed. Um, and all of this stuff would give you an idea of how to get out safely. And that is the way to approach complication anxiety, which is not to just wade in terrified, but to use that energy to think of ways to mitigate the risk. And there are tons of things you can do that make a procedure safer. Just think about the volume of injection as one variable. If you just did small amounts with each injection and validated that the patient was fine in between each one, checking capillary refill, checking their vision if you want to, that is going to make it much safer for you and it will actually reduce your risk. It's not actually rocket science. The thing that I think people do is they think they need to replicate the trainer who's been doing it for 10 years their moves and when they go back to their clinic they feel afraid to do like that type of injection they may have been right to be afraid afraid to do it but instead what i'd suggest you do is understand the dynamics how big are the vessels how deep are they how much volume does it take to cause blindness and then to design a strategy that takes into account those risks because that's what we've been doing for millennia as humans we've been studying the environment and thinking of safe ways to progress and that's all you need to do when it comes to non-surgical rhinoplasty is put a lot of brain power into understanding how to mitigate the risk and to move forward no matter how long it takes you forget the five minute nose job it might be an hour nose job with you that's the way that you need to do it in order to be safe. So that is my advice on complications, anxiety for noses. So bear in mind when you are being trained by someone, they are, have not gone on the same journey as you. They may not even have the same psychology as you. Some people do not worry about complications and they think that the, the way for them to go through life is to be confident and bombastic. And that's fine if it works for them. You don't have to be like that in your clinic. So you can do it 10 times slower if you want to. Own that, like do it slowly in stages. You don't have to copy someone who looks confident. If you don't feel comfortable, it's because you haven't, there's something, there's an instinct in you saying, you don't understand this well enough to do it safely yet. Put the brain power into that. Do the moves that you feel safe, even if it's longer and you'll get the job done. You'll bring that amazing difference to your patients and you'll do it safely. What are the best products for non-surgical rhinoplasty? Now, if you think about it, what we're really doing with most non-surgical procedures for the nose is we're emulating bone. We want our product to look like the bone on the nose. So what you want is a high G prime product. There are many of those to choose from. You could use Ju Juvenum, Voluma, you can use um, even non-reversal products are actually quite good at emulating bone, but I don't like using them because I can't reverse them. But you could use a non-reversal product if you think that's the best thing for your patient. But it's essentially stiff, high G-prime products that you need to use for non-surgical rhinoplasty. Is it true that non-surgical rhinoplasty can damage cartilage? 
I'm sure it probably is if you do high enough volumes, compression. I know it can affect the blood supply to various structures. Obviously, we know that from pressure um, as well. I've never seen a case of this happening, um, but I am sure it's possible. So if you are aware of a case or any more details, definitely drop a link in the YouTube show comments or if you're seeing this on Instagram. Um, I'm not aware of that, but it might be one of those areas I haven't come across yet. Can filler make your nose look bigger? Um, this is a really common question that patients ask and absolutely because you are adding volume technically it is bigger but what you'll find is that most non-surgical rhinoplasties are actually simplifying the shape and they're often elevating the points of reference so if you think of a nose projecting from a face if you have a big curved nose but you elevate the bridge of the nose the reference point that what makes the nose look like it's projecting gets gets raised so it essentially it's a little bit like an island if the water fills the island looks smaller because as the water rises up it closes in and there's less of the island to project out so it makes everything look smaller although you're adding volume it tends to look smaller obviously with a bad injection in the wrong place you can make it someone look worse and if you put all the filler in the tip of someone's nose they can look bulbous but in most cases i would say a good injector who's got an artistic eye will make your even a bigger nose adding more filler can actually look smaller aspiration with bd needles does it work so absolutely it does work i tested this with multiple fillers a few years ago so i would i'd fill a bevel of the needle and the syringe with a whole range of dermal fillers and i actually found that the bd needles worked slightly better slightly more sensitive to positives in fact i've actually had this in a nose we'll put the picture up on the screen i was injecting with a bd syringe aspirated and got blood back and this is because the bd syringes are relatively short if you think about the physics of aspiration the length of the needle is one of the things that is a positive predictor for, for positive reactions. So a shorter needle is more sensitive than a longer needle, and a th thicker needle is more sensitive than a thinner needle. And so BD syringes actually do quite well in terms of sensitivity with aspiration. But as I always say, you should test each filler with the needles that you use if you want to know if it's going to give you a positive. There are some fillers that no matter how long you wait, you never get the filler to flow back out of the needle lumen. So you never get a positive. So you need to know your filler before you rely on aspirating in any way. And as I always say, it's not a hundred, of course it's not 100% because nothing in life is 100%, but it gives you a shot of detecting intravascular placement before you inject. It's between 50 and 60% in papers where they aren't trying to maximize that number. Yes, if you're an aspirator, aspirate with BD syringe, test it first, but it usually works better than your normal needles. So what depth should you inject? So the main thing we're thinking about here is what are we trying to emulate, which is the bone, and where are the blood vessels? And the blood vessels in the nose tend to be in the middle layer. Now, that the whole area that you've got is very small, though. But it, I, like most blood vessels in the face, it tends to run in the hypodermis, in the, in the low end of the hypodermis. So you've got the dermis, the fatty layer, a blood vessel, and the muscles, typically. Now, there's very little space in the nose, so what that really means in practice is hard to say. So you, I assume that they are less likely to be on the periosteum, but could easily be, uh, it could still be very risky. And they're also less likely to be on the midline, but they can also be on the midline. So all of these factors lining up together, you cannot rely on just anatomical knowledge, um, just the probability or just aspirating. You have to stack on as many things as possible to make it a safe procedure. So how do you keep your needle steady during a non-surgical rhinoplasty procedure? Steadiness starts with your feet. The most important thing is to be standing stably. I see a lot of injectors leaning over. They're already unstable before they've even started injecting. Stabilize your feet, stabilize your pelvis, stabilize your the arm that you're about to inject with. And stabilize it usually at two points, one at, at the elbow or your forearm and another point near uh, near your hand so the, the only moving bit should be your fingers that's the ideal situation which is everything is stabilized at multiple points except for your fingertips and that's not always possible to do and if you st if you struggle then usually i just pull my arm in uh, if i'm in a certain position so that it's stabilized against my torso and that's the next best thing to leaning it on a more stable structure on the bed or your patient's shoulder a uh, great tip which i got via julie horn that Felix Bartram came up with because if you're a male clinician we obviously have a sensitivity around leaning on the patient's chest if they're a female so a really simple trick which I think is so simple that I I'm shocked I never thought of it myself but it's a beautiful idea which is just get your patient to cross their arm and then you get to lean on their arms rather than areas that may be more sensitive uh, <laughs> just look at your face <laughs> Do I do retrograde linear threads when doing a nose? Um, typically, I don't. I like to do small amounts, uh, 
at, at a time. So I'll do a little, I'll do an aspiration, a little bolus, validate that the tissue is moving, find the next point and repeat that rather than do doing linear threads. I don't really find the need to do that in noses very often. Maybe uh, occasionally if you're treating that sort of V-shaped cartilage showing, it makes more sense to do that. I use fillers that I know aspirate very well, so I'm more likely to do a little squeeze, little aspirate, little squeeze, little aspirate. Um, as I work my way along a, a groove rather than a, a single linear thread in an area that I think is high risk for blood vessels that you could block, even though I think the chance of blinding someone from the tip of a nose with 0.05 mils is basically zero. The higher up you go, the more high risk that would be. But for linear threads, I don't really would I wouldn't do that at the dorsum anyway. What's the best injection depth, superficial or deep? Now I could say. Technically, it's either superficial or deep, and the mid-depth is the most risky place to inject. But the reality is, in many noses, there's almost no space. So we'll have a look on ultrasound on the, tr the patient we're going to do today. And see how much room there actually is, because I think in reality, um, you're quite limited in terms of depth in certainly the bridge of the nose. I think there's a bit more room in the tip and there's a bit more room higher up, but nowhere is there tons of room to be very deep or very superficial. In terms of the aesthetic result, usually you don't want to be superficial because you're trying to emulate bone. I don't want to see a lump of filler. I want to change the shape of the skin from the base up. So I prefer usually being deeper than more superficial, uh, except for maybe some some rare situations where you're correcting creases or superficial features on the nose. What's the safest instrument to use for noses? Many of my followers were very annoyed at the inconsistency between trainers with respect to cannula versus needle in noses. So I think there is actually quite clear evidence that blindness is quite commonly associated with using a cannula, but that doesn't mean it's always the cannula in any situation or position that will cause blindness. It's particularly large boluses parallel with the, the core vessels. So if you're entering the tip of the nose and going all the way up, you're unlikely to go into a vessel. But if you do, you're likely to inject a lot into that vessel because that's the nature of cannula. You're in one position and you're filling quite a lot at a time. Needles inherently separate the boluses into smaller amounts because you have to move the needle to find the right position and take it out and find a new position. Whereas cannula, you can be inserted into the lumen, moving up and down, dragging the vessel with you and filling it. That's the big difference between needle and cannula. It's not so much the cannula that poses the risk. It's the fact that it's parallel with the vessel and though you tend to inject a large amount at a time. If you take a cannula and inject um, away from the midline, that's probably quite a safe injection because you're, you're not going that far. You're moving left and right and you're at 90 degrees to the vessels. So just think about what is most likely to cannulate a vessel. Any instrument that is parallel with it, where you're injecting a lot through one entry point, is gonna have a higher risk for severity even if the frequency is lower. This is quite a confusing concept I don't think many people have thought about, which is you can have higher risk for severity, but lower frequency of occlusion. And actually, in my mind, severity is a far bigger issue than frequency. I would rather have a small or a hundred small vascular occlusions than one really big one. And that is why cannula in noses is a risk in my opinion. So I hope this has helped you understand more about non-surgical rhinoplasty. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. See you next week.